Well, good morning, church family. Looks a little different here now that we're no longer a national park uh, for Glen Kirk's Grand Adventure, but we're, we're glad you're still worshiping with us today. You know, a couple of months ago, um, Cindy and I took a pottery class with a couple of friends, and let's just say it didn't go very well for me. Um, somehow, the clay, the wheel, and my hands could not figure out how to coordinate together very well. And I ended up with this small bowl filled with imperfections and flaws. There, you can see it on the screen. Um, thank you, lovers of fine art. Um, it'd probably be good for an ashtray if I smoked, and that's probably about it. Um, at the end of the class, um, I picked a glaze that would go on to the bowl, and um, it went into the kiln and was fired um, at like, I don't know, 12,000 degrees or something like that. And the fire permanently baked in all of the imperfections of my lack of skill as a potter. In the clay, or in the fire, clay hardens. And its imperfections and flaws become permanent. But metal is different in the fire. Metal works differently than clay when it goes into the fire. In fire, metal becomes pliable, shapeable. A skilled smelter can remove imperfections and ally, alloys, so, so metal becomes purer and more refined in the fire. A skilled blacksmith can use heated up metal to shape metal into something new, something usable. In the fire, clay permanently hardens, but metal softens so it can be shaped. We're in the midst of our summer series called forged in the furnace through the New Testament book of 1 Peter in the Bible. We have about three more weeks left in this series. And throughout 1 Peter, we've seen that the problems that we go through in life, the struggles and afflictions, are like a furnace. And in that furnace, God forges us like a master blacksmith forges metal. When we go through experiences, even traumatic experiences, it's not like clay being fired in a kiln where our imperfections and flaws become baked in and permanent. Instead, it's more like metal being forged as we become pliable and purified so we can grow and change and mature. As traumatic as some afflictions are, and some afflictions are just that, traumatic, there are also opportunities for God to do God's work. Afflictions can result in blessings in our lives. And today, from 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to see some of the blessings that God can bring into our lives when we go through the furnace of affliction. So if you're able, would you stand for the reading of God's word from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. But if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? 
So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. Peter says that we shouldn't be surprised when we go through the furnace of affliction. Affliction is part of the human condition. It's part of human life. There is no pain-free option to living in this human life that we have. And Peter uses several different words in this section to describe the afflictions that we go through. In verse 19, he calls them fiery ordeals. The, the Greek word he uses in verse 19 simply means burning, or, and it describes the experiences we go through that feel like fire. In, in fact, some Bible scholars think that Peter intended this burning, this fiery ordeal, to be taken literally. See, somewhere around 65 or 64 AD, somewhere around when Peter wrote this letter, the Roman Emperor Nero was known to douse Christians with tar, set them on fire, and then use them as human torches to entertain his guests at his garden parties in Rome. That would literally be a fiery ordeal. But whether Peter's being literal here or not, this word was used to describe afflictions of all kinds that feel like our lives have caught fire. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever gone through a situation that was so difficult that it felt like it was consuming you? A work situation that had your stomach tied in knots. A disease that was taking over your body with no treatment options available. Fiery ordeals. Peter uses the second word in that same verse, verse 12, the word test. A test is an evaluation of something's authenticity. When we take a test, we're being evaluated on something that we know or something that we do. A blacksmith heats up metal to test whether it's strong and whether it's pure. And afflictions do test us. They test our faith and they test our character. They test our love. They test our promises. Just like molten metal causes the alloy, alloys or imperfections within the mellow to rise to the surface, the furnace of affliction reveals our flaws, our rough edges, our growth areas. So some of you know that, that last weekend, an oak tree fell on my car. Now, it could have been a lot worse. No one was injured. It didn't hit our house, which is good. But yesterday, I found out that my insurance is declaring my car a total loss. And of course, the settlement isn't enough to replace the car that I had. And this experience, I got to tell you, is testing my character, my patience, my resilience. After all, it wasn't even my tree that fell. Have you ever had an experience that tested you? An, an experience maybe that revealed just how susceptible to certain temptations that you are? Or a long-term difficulty that tempted your patience? Or a difficult relationship that tested your commitment to love someone? Afflictions test us. Another word Peter uses in this section is the word insult in verse 14. And this word is a, is a word that describes how people talk about us. It's a word that describes when people say unfair and disparaging things either to us or about us to other people. When, when other people question our character or whisper half-truths about us or ascribe malicious motives to something that we do, that's their sin and that's our affliction. And once these things are spoken and they come out of a person's mouth or they're written down, they can't be undone or erased. These can happen from a friend or a family member, a fellow church member, a co-worker. And these things sting. It's the furnace of affliction. 
In verse 15, Peter uses the word suffering. The word suffer here is an English translation of the Greek word pasco, which is where we get the English word passion from. When we talk about Christ's passion, we're talking about his suffering. And pasco, this word for suffering, describes either physical or emotional pain that comes from outside of ourselves. Life is filled with this kind of pain. When we're the object of another person's hate through no fault of our own, that's pasco. When someone we care about dies unexpectedly, that's pasco. When we're crippled by anxiety or paralyzed by depression, that's pasco. And it's part of the furnace of affliction. The the, the final word that Peter uses in this section for the furnace is the word ashamed, also in verse 16. The the Bible was written in what's sometimes called an honor-based culture. And in that kind of setting, in that kind of culture, your honor consisted of the community's assessment of your worth or your value in that community. And your honor was gauged by how much you conformed to that community's values and behavior. The more you conformed to the community's expectations, the more honor you accumulated the less you conform to that community's values and behavior, the less honor you had and the more shame you accumulated. So in an honor-based culture, shame is not an inward feeling. It's a social status. Have you ever been shamed by those around you because you didn't fit into the majority? Maybe you were a nerd or awkward in school and other kids bullied you. That shame, the way that Peter's using it. Or maybe your convictions or your opinions caused others to treat you as an outcast. That's shame. When Peter's readers trusted in Jesus, they immediately started losing their honor in their community and accumulating shame. Because Christians were hated and despised. They were less than 1% of the population. And it wasn't because they were nerdy or awkward. It was because of their association with Jesus. These five words in this section describe some of the afflictions that we go through in life. Now, Now, sometimes we bring afflictions upon ourselves. We say things that, or do things that are hurtful, or we do things that are foolish, and we create our own suffering. We break promises, or we give in to temptation. We do shameful things, or we repeat a half-truth. Now, God is still with us when we cause our own afflictions. God's forgiveness is available to us, and God is able to come into those situations and to redeem them. But the blessings of the furnace that Peter wants to talk to us about today do not come from these self-inflicted afflictions. And that's why this section describes two different kinds of people. The first are people who go through the furnace of affliction because they're following Jesus. And Peter lists several ways to identify. In verse 14, he identifies these as people who suffer because of the name of Christ. Their identification with Jesus is the reason why they're suffering. It's not because they're hateful or they posted something online that's mean or untrue or they did something foolish. It's because of their association with the name of Jesus. And Peter continues this line of thought in verse 16 when he talks about those who suffer as a Christian. Now, this may surprise you. The word Christian only occurs three times in the Bible. And this is the third time. The first time it occurs is in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, when it says that followers of Jesus were first called Christians in the city of Antioch. They were called Christians. Presumably, they were called Christians by the non-Christians who lived in that city. You see, the word Christian 
was a word that was made up by non-Christians. In fact, it was probably intended to be an insult, a derogatory term. And here Peter takes a word that was created by non-Christians as an insult, and he owns it. That's why he says not to be ashamed to bear that name, Christian. In verse 17, he says that these blessings apply to those who are part of God's household. And in verse 19, that the blessings of the furnace are those who suffer according to God's will. But in verse 19, Peter tells us who the blessings of the furnace do not apply to. Murderers, those who show contempt for human life. Thieves, those who take what doesn't belong to them. Criminals, those who disregard social order. But then Peter includes meddlers on the list. And the word meddler is kind of unexpected here. It it doesn't seem to fit with the previous three. Now, it's very unlikely that Peter's readers that he was writing to were guilty of murder or stealing or breaking Roman law. It's more likely that Peter's entire point in this list is to focus on the fourth item, meddlers. And he includes the other items to show us just how serious meddling is. So what is a meddler? Well, the word meddler describes people who inappropriately interfere in other people's lives. It's a combination of two Greek words, the Greek word for overseer and the Greek word for belonging to another. And so meddlers are people who try to oversee what does not belong to them to oversee. In uh, Bible scholar John Eliot's commentary on 1 Peter, Eliot says that examples of meddling include criticizing the behavior of non-Christians inappropriately interfering in other people's families and sowing discord in society. Uh, Reformed Bible scholar Ramsey Michael says that we become meddlers when we set ourselves up as the guardians of public morality for other people. It's a good thing Christians don't do any of that stuff today. The word meddler here reminds me of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians when he asks the question, what business is it of mine to judge people outside the church? John Eliot in his commentary says that Peter here wants to focus on keeping our own house in order and attracting others to Jesus rather than criticizing them or meddling in their lives. And Peter puts meddling on the same level as contempt for human life, taking what doesn't belong to us, and engaging in criminal conduct. If you're a follower of Jesus and you suffer as a meddler, Peter is telling us that's no different than suffering as a murderer or a thief or a criminal. It will put you in the furnace for sure, but you won't experience the blessings of the furnace that Peter wants to tell us about. Okay, so I've taken a long time to get here. What exactly are these blessings that God can bring out of the furnace of affliction? This passage mentions at least five, and I want to mention them very quickly. The first is this, that when we go through the furnace, we closely commune with Jesus. We closely commune with Jesus. In the words of verse 13, we participate in the sufferings of Christ. That word participate, it's a word often translated fellowship or communion in the Bible. It's the same word used in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 for communing with Jesus in the Lord's Supper. That just as we commune with Jesus when we eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord's table, we also commune with Jesus in our suffering. Many Christians say that they want to be closer to Jesus. Well, the furnace is one of the ways that gets us there. When we pass through the furnace of affliction, we share in Christ's own passion. The medieval Christian author Thomas Akempis once wrote, 
Jesus has many lovers of his crown, but not many lovers of his cross. But there are aspects of our relationship with Jesus that we will never know apart from the furnace of affliction. Here's a second blessing from this passage. We joyfully experience God's presence. Joyfully experience God's presence. We see this in verse 14. The spirit of glory and of God rests on us when we go through the furnace. The the Bible often associates God's spirit and God's glory with God's presence around us. When we're going through an affliction, sometimes it feels as if God is absent. Even the the godliest and most mature followers of Jesus experience dark nights when they go through affliction. But as we emerge out the other side of the furnace, we begin to discern that the world around us is literally saturated with the presence of God. We begin to discern and to see and to experience God's presence in places that we never saw God before. We realize that there are no God-forsaken places in this world that God created. Through the furnace, we begin to joyfully experience even more the presence of God. Here's a third blessing. We honorably carry Christ's name. The furnace helps us honorably carry Christ's name. We see this in verse 16. Praise God that you bear that name, that name Christian. Bearing the the name Christian is a weighty honor. It's like being chosen to be a king's ambassador. It's like being authorized to speak and to act on behalf of a king. What an awesome, fearsome, humbling honor to bear the name of Christ. And going through the furnace of affliction is how we learn to bear his name with honor. Because the furnace refines our faith, reveals our character strengthens our resolve. Through the furnace, our flaws rise to the surface so we can see them. And so God, the master refiner, can mold and shape those flaws into strengths and virtues. And this is why we praise God, not because we enjoy suffering or because suffering in itself is good, But some affliction helps us bear the name of Jesus with honor. A fourth blessing in this section is we receive assurance that God will sort everything out. God will sort everything out. A lot of Christians misunderstand verse 17 of this section, that it's time for judgment to start with God's household. We're we're tempted to read that and think that that means that Our afflictions are God's judgment on us for our sins. But I don't think that's Peter's point at all. Peter here is trying to comfort and strengthen followers of Jesus. Peter's point is that our afflictions reveal that God has already started the sorting process of sorting the human race between those who respond to God's grace and God's love and those who reject God's grace and God's love. The furnace demonstrates the reality that God has chosen us, that we have been chosen by him to live in this world. So when it seems like the world is against us because we follow Jesus, we can be sure that God will sort it all out. In fact, he's already started. So we don't need to retaliate. We don't need to defend ourselves. We don't need to respond aggressively because in the furnace of affliction, God assures us that he is sorting it all out. The, The final blessing that we find in this section is through the furnace, we're even more motivated to keep doing good. Even more motivated to keep doing good. The last verse of this chapter, Peter tells us that we 
should commit ourselves to God, our faithful creator, and keep doing good. This has been a constant theme in 1 Peter. Back in chapter 2, he said, live such good lives that though people may accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your good deeds and glorify God. And then in chapter 2, verse 15, he said, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence your critics. When we go through the furnace of affliction, we receive even greater motivation to keep doing good, even if it causes suffering, even if we're rejected, misunderstood, or maligned, to keep doing good to other people. Thank God that the furnace of affliction doesn't treat our lives like clay, that our imperfections and flaws don't get permanently baked in and become hardened and unchangeable. But instead, when we follow Jesus, our afflictions are more like the blacksmith's furnace where our lives become pliable, moldable, shapeable in the hands of a loving God, the master blacksmith. And God can bring blessings, even out of the fire. The blessing of close communion with Jesus, an awareness of his presence, honorably bearing his name, assurance that God will sort it all out, and motivation to keep doing good. But it's a process. Part of our mission here at Glenkirk is summed up in that word, become. We see it on the wall every time we come into the sanctuary here. We are all in the process of becoming. Becoming more fully committed to Jesus. Becoming more loving. Becoming more holy. Becoming more like Jesus. Because all of us are imperfect. All of us are in process. If you're not yet all that God wants you to be, you are in the right place because you have plenty of company. Because we all have our stuff, our flaws, our rough edges, our blind spots. And one of the most important ways that we become is through the furnace of affliction. Only God can bring blessing out of fire that feels like it will consume us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words of Peter, Lord. And Father, in some ways, the afflictions that we face pale in comparison to some of the afflictions that these readers faced. And yet in other ways, Lord, the afflictions that we carry sometimes feel like they will destroy us. So, Father, I pray for everyone who is here today who is in the midst of a challenge, a trial, a fiery ordeal, a test. Lord, that you would meet them in this place and that through their faith in you, you would bring assurance that you can bring blessing even out of the worst of circumstances. So, Father, would you lift them up and help them endure in their faith? Would we all, Lord, look to you to see things as you see them, to strengthen us, even when it feels like we can't keep going? God, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.